Hello, and welcome back to Wellness Wednesday, a monthly series where experts share practical tips and techniques on topics that are important to patients, survivors, and caretakers alike. I'm Erin Kuhn Krieger from Ralph Pancreatic Cancer Foundation, and I'm so excited to be back to wrap up our 2022 season. We're doing things a little differently here tonight, as spoiler alert, we're pre recording. Tonight, we're going to take a little time to showcase the impact of the generous donations we receive from our community and our partners. Yes, these dollars, they go towards our mission to provide personal support to those affected by pancreatic cancer through tailored resources, connections, education, and funding for early detection research. But from there, it actually gets broken down into three main pillars. One is funding research for early detection and treatment options. Two is raising awareness of risk factors and symptoms. And finally, and perhaps just as importantly, for a personalized patient support. Tonight, we're going to focus on that first pillar and how Rolf funds research for early detection. You know, by awarding grants, we champion early detection research that will encourage innovation, improve outcomes in pancreatic cancer detection, uncover groundbreaking treatments and techniques, and of course, supports the family and the patients in the day-to-day of what they're going through. In this year alone, we have funded major projects at leading institutions. For example, Dr. Nicholas J. Roberts at Johns Hopkins is leading the study targeting oxidative stress in ATM-deficient pancreatic ductal angiocarcinoma. This study involves continuing research into genetic variants into the ATM gene, which have been previously associated with the risk of familial pancreatic cancer. Dr. Excuse me, Dr. Kay McCloy from University of Chicago is spearheading at the origin BNIP3 and what it tells us about pancreatic cancer progression. This program, it studies a gene known as BNP, BNIP3, which has been shown to be an early biomarker for pancreatic cancer. And Dr. Laura Wood is leading another study at Johns Hopkins called 3D Analysis of the Aging Human Pancreas. This project involves CODA, a method of 3D examination and virtual reconstruction that allows for new types and analysis of human pancreatic tissue. We've also provided grant money to Cancer Wellness Center to fund their counseling programs, weekly support group, the monthly pancreatic cancer networking group, educational programs, wellness groups, outreach to provide psychosocial support, presentations, and activities for the pancreatic cancer community. Another grantee and longtime partner is the Lust Garden Foundation, where we're currently funding the Felix program, focuses on developing new methods using artificial intelligence to detect smaller pancreatic cancer. Tonight, actually, we are featuring a video from Lust Garden showcasing those new technologies to drive better outcomes in early detection. And while we won't be doing a live Q&A tonight, we we do hope that you'll add your comments and questions in the chat and in below so that we can make sure to have those answered. So now I present to you Lust Garden the intersection of science and technology advancing patient care. The Lust Garden Foundation has really been a foundation for spurring pancreatic cancer research across America and the globe. Without Lust Garden support, and especially the community, I wouldn't be able to ask big questions or make innovative discoveries. We aim to understand how glycosylation reshapes the tumor immune microenvironment, how that influences immune suppression, and how we might be able to better um, design immunotherapies to overcome uh, these limitations. And the Lust Garden Foundation has supported this work, uh, and it's critical because this is a very unique area that's poorly understood. The Lust Garden Foundation has supported interactions, I would say, sort of far and wide, uh, interactions within my institute, collaborating across many different domains, working on pancreas cancer collaborations within my region, across town, local hospitals, other investigators, and collaborators really across the country and indeed around the world, coming together to think about what are the big problems and how we can collectively uh, pursue them together in ways that we really can't do as effectively as individuals. Bus Garden has been really the, the emphasis of pushing scientists at MSK across the country for continuing the passion and push toward curing pancreatic cancer. There's a long ways to go, but we would not be where we are without the Lust Gardens Foundation support and focus on pancreas cancer as a disease that we can treat and cure. Lust Garden Foundation, thank you.
Good morning. I'm Linda Tintawi, CEO of the Lust Garten Foundation, and welcome to the fourth of our five-part series of Lust Garten Live events for 2022. We are so glad you could join us this morning. Tremendous progress has been made in identifying pancreatic cancer at its earliest stages. Research led by Lust Garten focuses on intercepting a cell mutation before it becomes a tumor, developing novel approaches to detect pancreatic cancer earlier, and developing vaccines that could reduce one's risk in the future. Today, you'll meet some of the experts addressing these challenges, as well as leaders whose embrace of emerging technologies could drive better outcomes overall. Thank you to our presenting sponsor, ViewRay Technologies, our series sponsor, Ipsen, and our event sponsors, the Rolf Foundation and Miami Cancer Institute. We'll be happy to take your questions as we move throughout the webinar. And if you could use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and go ahead and uh, use the, not the chat, but the Q&A, we will answer your questions as best as we can. I'm very pleased to introduce the Lust Garten VP of Research, Dr. Andrew Rakeman. Hi, Andy. What a great lineup we have today. It is, Linda. It's a fantastic uh, lineup today. Fantastic speakers and a lot to cover. So we're gonna get right into it. And we have the, the meeting today will really be broken into two parts. And then the first part, as you alluded to, we're gonna dig in on all of the advancements that are happening for really understanding and being able to find and treat pancreatic cancer at the earliest stages, even before it starts potentially. And what's most exciting to me today is we're gonna hear about some exciting research and what we're learning new about the biology but most importantly, some real concrete examples of what that's going to look like as it moves forward into the clinic and some new products and new approaches to, to impact patients there. Um, so our first guest to help us kick us off in this uh, process is Dr. Brian Wolpin. Um, Dr. Brian Wolpin is the Robert T. and Judith B. Hale Chair in Pancreatic Cancer at the Farber Cancer Institute. He's also a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. He also happens to be the principal investigator of the Lust Garten Lab at Dana Farber Cancer Institute. And on top of all of that, is also a medical oncologist and sees patients and really uh, takes this disease really quite to heart. Through uh, Brian's research, which you'll hear about, he approaches pancreatic cancer in a number of ways, including both basic and clinical research to really understand what are these early events of pancreas cancer? Who is at risk and how to move it forward? So Brian, thank you so much for being here and kicking us off. And I really hope in, in, as in your remarks, you can help to kind of set the stage about what's so important about detecting pancreas cancer early, what we need to understand and divide, define some of these terms that we hear, kind of surveillance, detection, interception prevention, and how those are unique and, and all really critical for us to move forward here. Excellent. Thank you, Andy. And also a thanks to Linda um, and really to the Les Garten Foundation as a whole. I, I think as it was said in the original video, really the foundation has been a critical partner in moving research forward in pancreatic cancer. And really the field would not be where it is today with all the support from the foundation. So as Andy said, I'm going to share my screen. There's Boston. Um, all right. So Really, the first session is um, dedicated to concepts around early detection and interception, in particular, how we can harness new technologies uh, to drive better outcomes for our patients. So I think my job is to sort of set this up a little bit, tell you a bit about how we define some of these things, and give you a sense of how some of this work is moving forward. Uh, and then the next two speakers will also then move forward with talking about new ways that we can impact early detection um, and interception, and I'm obviously excited to hear about uh, their efforts too. So I'm going to start out with just one overview slide. I know this audience is familiar with pancreatic cancer and some of the challenges uh, that we have in, in treating this disease, but I really just want to start out with one overview slide. So if you focus at the top, these colored bars are the stage at presentation for patients with pancreatic cancer. So the green bar is stage one or two, uh, this is the earliest stage in which the cancer is identified. It is in this case called localized disease. And these patients have the opportunity with aggressive therapy like chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery uh, to uh, be cured in some instances. And really what we see is this group, this curable group, remains a relatively small right, percentage, that's the 20%, 
of the total number of patients who present with pancreatic cancer each year uh, in this country. And as you see, stage three, which is called locally advanced disease, these are larger tumors that invade around the structures near the pancreas and are hard to remove by surgery and hard to cure. And also metastatic cancer, which is cancer that has spread to distant sites, actually make up about 80% of the patients that come in to see us in clinic. So just by looking at these numbers alone, you can obviously see that one of the goals needs to be that we take patients who presented with more advanced disease and in the future find them earlier, right, with early stage disease where we have an opportunity to cure these patients. And I think also relevant to the second session today, uh, we also need to identify more and more effective therapies that can then uh, treat these patients uh, better. So again, clear problem, need to diagnose the cancer earlier. Uh, how do we start thinking about that? So as Andy suggested, I thought I would include a few definitions here because these words are used a lot and make sure we're all on the same page, <clears throat> excuse me, about what they mean. So the first one here is cancer prevention. So not everyone agrees exactly on these definitions, but I would say these are generally agreed upon. This is how I tend to think about it. So for cancer prevention, really what we're trying to do is stop the cancer developing from developing before the process of the cancer has begun. Sometimes this is also called risk reduction. So an example of this would be saying obesity is a risk factor for pancreatic cancer and other cancers, and we will have individuals do exercise programs and diet to try to prevent obesity and prevent the development of cancer altogether. So this is an example of cancer prevention. You'll often hear the word cancer interception, and this is really where you're trying to disrupt the cancer process when it's a pre-cancer, so in the lead up to it becoming a cancer, or when it's a very early invasive cancer. This is cancer interception. An example of this would be you get a colonoscopy, and at the time of colonoscopy, you have a polyp, right? And the polyp is a pre-cancer. That polyp is removed at the time of colonoscopy, and you've now intercepted a cancer that might have developed, but now it doesn't because you've removed it. So you've intercepted it before it became a cancer, okay? And then the third is early detection. So cancer early detection. And this is really an active intervention to find the cancer earlier than if you just let someone go through regular care, okay? And this often is sort of put into two bins because we approach them a little bit differently um, when we're thinking about early detection strategies. One is in asymptomatic people. So people have no symptoms of a cancer and you're either doing screening or surveillance to find the cancer early. So screening is in the general population. An example of this would be like a mammogram for uh, women, which they get every one to two years to try to find breast cancer early, right? That's a general population, starts af after a certain age. Or surveillance is often referring to in a high-risk population. We'll talk about this a little bit more. And then there's also an opportunity when people present with first their initial symptoms of cancer, to find it earlier than if it just went through regular care. And that really means enhancing people's awareness of what symptoms to be aware of, uh, and also making sure that if someone were to develop that symptom, they have access to care and that the evaluation is quick, right? That they have timely evaluation. So these are sort of some initial definitions to get us started, cancer prevention, cancer interception, and then cancer early detection. So I wanted to start off with a concept that we think about, which is sort of the pancreatic cancer risk timeline. And the reason we think about this is it has been very difficult to screen the general population for pancreatic cancer. And this has been in part because although pancreatic cancer is a difficult disease when it develops, it is substantially less common than many of the cancers that we do population screening for, like say colon cancer or breast cancer. And what that means is it's been hard to implement a general population screening approach. And so what has developed and continues to be developed is an idea of trying to understand who's at risk for disease and then using those higher risk individuals to then initiate screening programs, or in that case, really it would be called surveillance, right? A surveillance program where you're looking at individuals at higher risk. And so how we think about this is sort of with a timeline like this. And the slide's a little busy, but, but let me show you. So really the cancer diagnosis is over here to the right. And as you go backward in time, these are the negative numbers, one year before diagnosis, three years, 10 years, 
20 years before diagnosis, there are things along this trajectory that increase the risk of getting pancreas cancer or are a symptom that occur early, a symptom that occurs early and tells you the cancer may be developing, right? So on the left, you can see risk factors, things that are present decades before and increase the risk of developing pancreas cancer. We mentioned obesity, that's on this list. Um, and there are also others, things like family history or inheritance of genetic mutations. And I'll tell you a little bit more about this because that's an area where I think we've made substantial progress even in the past several years. But there also are these things over here like the onset of new elevated blood glucose or weight loss that are not actually a risk factor for the cancer, they're being caused by the cancer and they're happening in that one or two years before the cancer is diagnosed. And so a second area here is can we use some of these symptoms to trigger earlier evaluations? And I can say as, a, as an oncologist seeing patients in clinic, often my patients will tell me, you know, six months ago, nine, 12 months ago, I started having some, you know, symptoms. And in retrospect, those were probably due to the cancer, but were hard to make that link at the time. So the question is, how do we help make that link to try to find the cancer earlier? All right, so I'm going to start off by giving you an example over here. So a, a risk factor for pancreas cancer and how interventions have now started to change how we detect the cancer. And so what I'm going to focus on in this slide is related to familial risk. So either families that have multiple family members with pancreas cancer or a genetic mutation that predisposes them to pancreas cancer. And this is a manuscript and a study that was just recently published. It's a program called the CAPS program run by Mike Goggins and Mimi Canto at Johns Hopkins. And this was an eight center, actually including my own project, where individuals with family histories that were strong for pancreatic cancer, multiple family members, or genetic mutations underwent evaluation with ultrasound and MRI. And so this is a population we know are at elevated risk, but there really has not been conclusive evidence until the past several years that if we do this surveillance, right, we take this high-risk group and we do imaging studies like ultrasound and MRI, that we could find it early. But really the data are now accumulating that that is true. And that's really what the pie charts show at the bottom, which is if somebody is on surveillance, which is the pie chart on the right, you find a lot more patients with earlier stage disease, including a substantial portion with stage one disease, which we talked about at the beginning, really can be cured with aggressive therapies. Whereas if they're not on surveillance or they fall off of the surveillance program, it becomes much more like what you see in the general population where patients tend to be diagnosed with late stage disease. And then this really matters, right? These are curves to the right about how patients do after the cancer is diagnosed. The green line is sometimes we actually find pre-cancers. And when those are removed, people do very well, right? They don't even have an invasive cancer yet. The pre-cancer is removed and they really don't go on to get cancer at all. But also if you find the disease earlier, a substantial portion of patients can be cured and live for many years. And that's really what we're trying to accomplish. And I think these studies have really been key because they have started to show that if you have a high-risk group and you do surveillance, that you can find the disease earlier and you can impact outcomes. Also related to this, I think as folks on the, on the webinar may know, it's also led as, as other studies have shown, all patients with pancreas cancer should get genetic testing, right? To see if a mutation was present that led to their cancer. And then those family members, if there is a mutation found should also be tested. So this really has changed how we care for patients in the clinic and really now has emphasized the need for us to think about surveillance. All right, so that's the sort of risk factor side of things. What about the early symptom side of things? How can we use that? So this is a study actually we're just finishing um, from our group at Dana-Farber. And really what we wanted to think about was weight loss. So a lot of patients, when they come to see us in clinic, they say, oh, I've lost 10 or 15 pounds. And that, that can even begin uh, six, 12, sometimes even a little bit longer months before the cancer was diagnosed. So this is a large scale study that we're just finishing where we're trying to think, how can we understand what weight loss is related to cancer, right? Weight loss can be a totally healthy thing, right? People exercise more or they eat healthier and they can lose weight on purpose for good reason because it's a healthy thing for them to do. And really what we're trying to understand is 
what's the unhealthy weight loss that comes from the cancer? And how do we identify that earlier? And we've been taking a pretty broad lens to this, which is, it turns out there are multiple cancer types that are related to weight loss, not just pancreas cancer. Uh, you can see pancreas cancer rises towards the top of the list, but a host of different cancers, particularly gastrointestinal cancers can cause this. And really the goal of this study, and there are a set of studies related to this and other groups are doing, how do you identify symptoms that are from the cancer and how do you understand how they can be an alert sign that the cancer should be looked for? And again, this is not easy because weight loss can be also from normal things that people do, but really trying to understand how the weight loss could be related to cancer. And so this is a big effort, again, around these ideas of early warning symptoms and using those to find cancer early. We'd like a practical recommendation to provide to patients and to providers. All right, so then you might say, well, okay, these are interesting, right? These are familiar risks. This is a, a pre-diagnostic symptom of weight loss. Can we start to be even broader and really think about how do you put lots of different factors together to then understand who's at elevated risk for pancreas cancer and should undergo surveillance. And the Luscarn Foundation has been very active in this area, and it's really trying to use new technologies, particularly machine learning approaches, to be able to understand how to identify at-risk people from large populations. And the Luscarn Foundation has funded grants in this area. I would say the Kenner Family Foundation has also been very involved in this area. And really what it has taken advantage of is one, improvements in math, right, as we understand machine learning. And two, the fact that medical records have really become digitized, right? It's not me writing down on a piece of paper in sort of messy handwriting anymore. Everything is typed into a, a medical record or most things that are digitized and can be searched. And so this is a study that we've been doing here at Dana-Farber. Chris Sander is the leader of this study where we've been looking at large populations with millions, millions of people, and try to understand among those, the red triangle suggests a pancreas cancer diagnosis. What are the, the events in their medical record that would have clued us in to the pancreas cancer diagnosis coming? And this can be both a combination of risk factors and also symptoms that they develop using sort of the latest approaches to machine learning and then being able to predict risk ultimately with the goal of moving this technology into a clinical setting where you would have behind the scenes an ability to assess risk among individuals within a health system and then alerts going to primary care physicians that this person's at elevated risk for this disease and we should be thinking about how to do surveillance to find the cancer early. So a lot of work using machine learning, digitized records, uh, risk assessment to try to understand not just for high-risk families, right, the families that have a lot of pancreas cancer, but what about everyone else, right? The, the high-risk families are maybe 10 to 15 percent. We really want to understand larger groups of individuals who may be at risk. All right, so this I'm not going to touch on too much because uh, Dr. Levy is going to talk about this, but really another piece to this is, okay, we have these people who are at risk. We can use some of the factors we've been talking about, but are there things that are readily accessible and non-invasive that we can do to tell us, again, that this person is someone we should be keeping track of, that this person is someone we may be concerned about a pancreas cancer. So you can see here, this cartoon is the, a blood vessel, supposed to be your bloodstream. Uh, and this over here is the tube of blood that you give when you get phlebotomy. And tumors, uh, whether it be pancreas or other tumors, have vessels that are part of the tumor, and they can shed or secrete different things into the bloodstream that can be clues to the developing tumor. And there are lots of different technologies now that are being explored for this. There's DNA in the blood, there's proteins, RNA, metabolites, which are small molecules. There even are attempts to look at the tumor cells themselves and if some of them are circulating in the blood. And then what are called extracellular vesicles, which are little blebs that come off the tumor. And each of these provides us the opportunity to have a readout that a tumor is developing and use blood samples to try to detect this. And again, it can add to our ability to combine data and know who may be at risk and who needs more follow-up uh, and close attention for pancreas cancer. So tons and tons of work in this space. All right, this is the last example I'll give. So there really has also been a, a real increase in the use of imaging to try to find pancreas cancer early. So imaging tests are hard. They have a hard time finding pancreas cancers. They tend to be 
you know, the pancreas is deep in the abdomen and the pancreas tumors can be small. They're not easy to see. And so this is also leveraging really the latest in machine learning approaches to try to identify uh, either small tumors in the pancreas or signatures in the pancreas that a small tumor is coming. And so this is called the Felix Project. This is a project funded by the Luskarten Foundation trying to find small tumors, which is what this little red orangey dot here is within the pancreas, which is the purple blue. This is a, a paper that was just published, also using machine learning approaches from the team at Mayo Clinic, saying let's not look for the tumor, but let's, let's look for the consequences in the pancreas as the tumor is developing. Again, using machine learning approaches, and this is the pancreas here. And then this is a study from our group where we said, well, let's not only look at the pancreas, it turns out the tumor affects multiple tissues in the body, right? The body has a sense that something is there and something isn't right. This is actually looking at skeletal muscle in the body as a whole and seeing are there reactions in the body to the developing tumor for which, for which there are. And so it's really trying to put together, again, using a number, actually all three of these used machine learning algorithms on scans to really understand what are the signatures for the tumor that's coming. And then another day we can talk, there also are new imaging approaches that the Luskarten Foundation has funded grants that are using not just CT, but other imaging approaches. All right, so I'm gonna finish with this as sort of the summary slide. But really the, the goal of this part of the, of the webinar today was to say there really are a number of inputs, right? Genetics and exposures and symptoms, hopefully blood tests and imaging studies that can allow us to start to pick those people out of the population who need surveillance or need evaluation. And we can do this using these multiple inputs to define those that are low risk, and we can just let them have their regular care as always. But for those at high risk to really start to think about the things we talked about at the beginning, let's prevent the disease, right? By doing interventions like smoking cessation and obesity management. Let's surveil the disease, like in the family history group, right? With imaging studies like ultrasound, MRI, other tests. Let's intercept this, which is what Niha is gonna talk about. How do we then know that these people are at risk Let's do something to intercept that disease before it even develops, and then effective early detection uh, to allow us to do treatment. So I'm gonna just stop there and say thank you. A lot of people for the data from my own group um, were very helpful, and I'll stop here. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Wolpe. That was, that was fantastic, and I think did a great job of, of setting the stage for our discussion here and really outlining, I think, a lot of what the challenges are that, that you pointed out, that these symptoms that are out there and they exist, but they're not super specific, that there are changes that are happening that are hard to detect. But I think that last slide with the calculator really shows what the future is of how, now that we can take a little bit of our small human brains out of this and find ways to put all of these different inputs together, that's going to help us make uh, 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 better decisions and, and better predictions for patients in the future. So thank you for, for that. It's been, it was a fantastic talk. Um, so with that, I think is an excellent setup to move on to our, our next speaker, Dr. Samuel Levy, uh, who comes to us from, uh, from Blue Star Genomics, where he is the chief scientific officer, um, and is going to tell us a story of what, what his company is working on, which you'll hear some of the themes that we heard from Dr. Wolpen coming up on how to bring together these novel methods and ways to detect things in blood that we hadn't been able to in the past, but combining that with the real understanding of the biology of the disease and who's at risk and, and how to take it forward. So Dr. Levy, thank you so much for, for joining us today and uh, looking forward to, to hearing your talk and hearing an update on what Blue Star is doing and really how you see a path forward for using these kind of novel technologies to uh, get us into a better point for screening and surveillance for pancreas cancer. Thank you, Dr. Eggman, I, uh, and it's a great pleasure to be here to present our work. Um, we appreciate, as always, the, uh, the contributions from Lust Garden Foundation to enable the kinds of progress that we've been hearing about so far. I'm much appreciative also to Dr. Walpin for giving such a great introduction. I feel some of the slides that I'm going to tell you about have been very, very adequately covered. So um, I'll go ahead and, and really switch the attention um, right now on uh, some of the work we've been doing for early detection. You've heard already um, quite extensively that there are a couple of prongs by which we can um, reduce the rather dire statistics that you see on this slide. 
whereby almost 80% or more of patients diagnosed with pancreatic cancer annually um, end up succumbing to the disease. And part of the challenge that you see here is that um, disease um, diagnosis is rather compressed. There's very little time. Five year survival, you can see, is about 11%. Um, across all disease stages. And really without any changes to the approaches, and thankfully the approaches that Dr. Wappen covered are areas whereby we can make progress. But without any of that progress, um, pancreatic cancer is gonna be one of the second leading causes of cancer mortality in the next decade. So we really believe that increasing early detection, um, enabling, uh, patients to come to therapeutic interventions earlier is going to be a key aspect to making progress here. And so at Blue Star, we've been work, thinking about this quite hard. Why do patients um, get diagnosed so late? And part of that is because, as you heard, symptoms are hidden, um, diseases are occult. Um, if you look at the statistics, as you see on this slide, uh, greater than 50% of patients um, a diagnosed with stage four disease. As you heard from Dr. Walpin, stage four disease really has a very low chance of survival. Um, and, uh, but the, the reassuring and um, optimistic part of these statistics, frankly, hidden in here, is that if you can detect early stage disease, depicted here as stage 1A, the chances of survival are uh, greatly increased by tenfold. And that's really where we believe um, we should be focusing our efforts on early detection. And that's what I'm going to try and tell you about today and convince you that there's a great opportunity here to, to really shift this for patients. You also heard uh, in the previous talk that using strategies like clinical risk, determining which patients are at higher risk for pancreatic cancer is a place where you can really focus and enrich populations and perhaps, as you heard, surveil them for the occurrence of disease. And <clears throat> this plot here shows that there are well-known risk uh, factors involved uh, with pancreatic cancer, chronic pancreatitis, genetic predisposition. <clears throat> Both of these conditions actually elevate the, the pancreatic cancer risk for a population by almost an order of magnitude, up to 10 to 13 fold, above the general population. And clearly of the three to 400,000 patients a year <clears throat> that have been tracked with these kinds of conditions, as you heard, surveillance is very valuable. Keep imaging them, keep doing molecular testing and so on. Another area um, that we've found uh, and a number of other investigators have been working on over the years is the uh, link between pancreatic cancer and new onset diabetes. As you can see um, figured in this uh, center region here, new onset diabetes confers almost an eightfold higher risk for pancreatic cancer. Um, and annually in the US, about a million patients a year are diagnosed with new onset diabetes. So this is type two diabetes. This number is likely to rise, unfortunately, over the, the coming years. And this is an opportunity to really enrich and target this population for early detection. Of the new onset diabetics, one in 100 will be diagnosed with pancreatic cancer over a three year period. And, and targeting this group for early detection would be really crucial and key. The link between pancreatic cancer and type two diabetes has been established for a while now. The belief is that the disease occurs initially, an ablation or, or, or uh, an abnormal expansion of cells in the pancreas end up um, destroying pancreas tissue and causing insulin resistance. This leads to the kinds of characteristics that one sees typically that corresponds to type two diabetes. There's another form of pancreatic cancer, which is essentially individuals with long-standing diabetes because of their insulin resistance over a period of time are at higher risk for cancer. This, this top panel though, this panel going from the occurrence of pancreatic cancer causing type two diabetes ends up 
from the literature showing us that there, there, there's far more um, mortality and a, a worse course for survival for this kind of disease where pancreatic cancer causes type 2 diabetes. So we think walking backwards, identifying a risk factor like new onset type 2 diabetes will lead us to a population to really focus on. So how can we do this? I've told you already that this is now an enrichment strategy. We're looking for, for characteristics that are clinical in, in diabetes management that we can target individuals. So what do we do? Do we screen all of those folks using imaging approaches or the existing blood-based biomarkers? This is certainly an approach, and um, that, that's actively, as you heard, an approach that some groups have been adopting. And the challenge with all these surveillance techniques is that even though it's an enriched population, you're typically dealing with um, very, uh, low specif very uh, low specificity in detection, meaning that your false positive rate using these different modalities is quite high. I'd like to tell you that there's another kind of approach that we have been adopting over the last five years that employs a DNA-based measurement that looks at epigenomic change in the genome. And as you heard from Dr. Wolpin, the blood that contains DNA that comes from tumor cells and other cells impacted around the tumor are essentially the target by which we're able to look at epigenomic change. The key aspect of this approach that really attracted us was that it's very highly specific. The false positive rate is extremely low and we're able to detect disease without any kind of intrusive biopsy. And so I'll explain to you how we've put this together and, uh, and where we are in this process of, of generating data. Um, I'll take a step back first, though, to tell you what is epigenomics, because you've probably heard a lot about genomics and DNA and DNA templates and, and uh, inherited material and so on. Epigenomics is really um, a, a combination of the genome and how the genome is manifest in a cell. And in naturality, tumor biology is greatly characterized by changing epigenomics. If you look at some of the top predictors of cancer biology using either DNA signals or RNA signals, RNA is how genes are expressed from the genome, you can see a very small fraction of predictors actually relate to DNA mutations. A slightly larger fraction relate to changes in chromosomal structure. Again, tumor cells modify their chromosomal, stru chromosomal structure, so we expect that to happen. But the vast majority of predictions that one could make around cancer biology really focus on gene activity. So which genes are on and which genes are off? Because those essentially differ in a tumor cell versus a normal cell. And epigenomics is really the study of exactly gene activity and the intersection of gene activity with how those genes are turned on and off. Because cancers find ways of changing how to switch genes on and off and make them aberrant in nature. And so what we're looking at is an epigenomic change. And we believe epigenomic changes will enable us to get to earlier pancreatic cancer detection. We have found a signal floating around in blood that is essentially coming from cells that is related to uh, a part of the DNA that's modified of the four bases in DNA. The cytosine base goes through this methylation pathway that you see in the center part of the screen. It's a little bit complex. I don't want you to focus on that. What I would like you to focus on is there's one aspect of this methylation pathway that I'm circling now, 5-hydroxymethylation, 5-HMC, that we have been able to pinpoint using very specific chemistry. And when we couple that with DNA sequencing, we are able to actually find regions that are epigenomically changing. By that, I mean this 5-HMC signal points to genes that, whose transcription is modified, their expression, if you like, is changed, and regions of the genome 
that control the expression of those genes is also changed. And so with a single chemistry, we're able to pinpoint directly from the blood of a patient what is changing. And so we have this uh, technology, and the thought was, can we dynamically measure epigenomic change by looking at cancer patients? And so we've done that by creating a Sentia training set of patients. We're trying to come up with a pancreatic cancer detector using epigenomics. And what I'm going to describe to you on this slide is the process by which we've done this. We take a group of pancreatic cancer patients with known disease across all the stages, early and late stage, and then a companion group of patients without cancer. We draw a tube of blood, and from that blood, we extract DNA. This CF DNA that you see here is basically cell-free DNA. It's the DNA that is shed from, from cells in general, some of them tumor cells, and many of the normal cells. Our technology is able to pinpoint changes between tumor and normal. And there's a very key part to this. Um, part of it is the chemistry that I described to you on the previous slide, and we essentially execute this in our lab. The other part is machine learning. You heard that terminology used already multiple times. It, it is a technology that enables us to point the data to an algorithm and the algorithm figures out how to essentially find signals that enable us, in this case, to predict pancreatic cancer against the backdrop of no cancer. And so when we point our machine learning tool to this data set of over 600 patients, we're able to come up with a classification algorithm. The classification algorithm uses multiple changes in 5-HMC and other epigenomic changes that I haven't yet told you about and combines them into a single kind of module. And that module is just emits whether the patient has cancer or non-cancer. It's very simple. So we wanted to test how well this works. And so we assembled a completely different data set of patients, over 2000 of them. A hundred of them had pancreatic cancer, 2000 did not. And the goal here was to measure how well our algorithm worked on these blinded samples and how well it predicted the ability to, to detect both cancer and non-cancer. Recall, we have to do both. We have to find the patients that have the disease, but we do not want to find patients that do not have the disease. And in this cohort of patients, we had individuals with new onset diabetes, long-standing diabetes, and other high-risk factors. You heard that also mentioned about family history and genetic mutations. So we've got this kind of big group of, of different factors that we're looking at. And indeed, the sensitivity of the test, and, and apologies, this terminology is somewhat overlapping. Sensitivity and specificity sound very similar, but they're very different. Sensitivity is measuring the percentage of patients with pancreatic cancer that are accurately detected. And you can see across all stages, but especially early stage disease where we really want to do well on, we're detecting two thirds of these patients. And recall the standard of care, what typically patients get um, tep has much lower uh, sensitivity and also lower specificity. So we've, we've measured this up and found that this is very competitive. In terms of specificity, we're extremely high. So that's the percent of non-cancer patients accurately detected. You can see that's 97%, so 3% false positive. So we have this tool now, and this tool is a clinically available tool. The future in our minds of early detection is really using this tool in clinical trials. And we have an ongoing clinical trial called NODMED that looks at 6,500 patients over the next 12 months to see um, for these new onset diabetic patients whether in fact they're diabetes is caused by pancreatic cancer using the test I just described. In parallel, we have a, a, a companion study working with our colleagues at NCI who are working on a NOD population, a new onset diabetic population, to do early detection of pancreatic cancer using imaging. As you heard, that's another modality. So we're trying to combine our molecular tests with imaging with this particular cohort. And so we're able to essentially offer this test broadly, and we've 
also lined up some early adopters, uh, early adopters, clinicians that will use this for other clinical trials, looking at genetic mutations and family history. So I, I'll stop there and obviously happy to answer any questions in the next session, but we appreciate the opportunity to talk today. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Dr. Levy. It's very exciting to see, and as we saw from, from Dr. Wolpen earlier on, the impact that putting people at known risk into surveillance through the CAP study, where you really can drive to better outcomes. It's great to see additional options coming forward that are simpler to deploy than, than imaging, um, and especially for patient populations like this new onset diabetes, compared to people with a family risk who really understand and are maybe more willing to accept the burden of repeated imaging for people with uh, a, a diagnosis of diabetes, already a life-changing diagnosis, want, will want a simpler solution to be able to put it into understanding risk. So congratulations on all the work and really look forward to seeing that, that trial as it moves forward to see if you help can, can drive those same kind of outcomes in, in these patients. Thank you, Dr. Thank Brady. You so much. Yeah. And, and so with that, now we'll, we'll uh, move on to our, our third speaker from this section, uh, Dr. Niha Zaidi, who is an assistant professor of oncology and a GI medical oncologist at the Sydney Kimmel Comprehensive Cancer Center at Johns Hopkins. Uh, uh, Dr. Zaidi is both a talented clinician and a talented clinical researcher. She's driven uh, lots of new clinical trials, testing immunotherapies and combinations of immunotherapies in pancreatic cancer. But what we've asked her to come in today to discuss with you is a very exciting clinical trial that she's the principal investigator on that's looking at a uh, using a vaccine in what some of these patients that we know or individuals that we know are at high risk for developing pancreatic cancer but have not yet been diagnosed with the disease to see if we can alter the course of the disease um, at that at those earliest stages so very early on so Dr. Zaidis, thank, thank you so much for, for joining us here today um, and really look forward to, to hearing about your work in this really exciting trial and how this can be you know, transformative in, into thinking about how we care for these individuals. I know we've seen that data from the CAP study that, that's so compelling, but again, requires very intensive treatment, you know, surgery and, and chemo. And you know, if we want to get into treating people before they're sick, we need to do that very safely. And I, and I think you have some clues that that might be possible, or at least we're going to find out soon enough. Thank you so much, Dr. Rakeman, and uh, thank you so much for the foundation for the incredible support, especially in this area of early interception and vaccines. This is certainly an area that's in its infancy, but has the potential to make a great impact. So very appreciative for the opportunity to speak. Um, so as Dr. Rakeman mentioned, I'll really be focusing on um, vaccines, which I've been working on um, for the early interception of pancreas cancer. And I know Dr. Wolpin um, already defined these terms, but I'd like to just bring it in the context of vaccines, which I'll be focusing on. And as you all know now, prevention vaccines have made really a tremendous impact for virally driven cancers. And one example that everyone's familiar with is the HPV vaccine for the uh, prevention of cervical cancer. But now what we're really starting to think about is how do we intercept the development of non-virally driven cancers? So what's the difference between prevention and an interception vaccine? Well, we've been traditionally thinking about prevention vaccines like the HPV vaccine, where we're vaccinating these otherwise healthy individuals most of the time prior to their seeing the initial viral causing insults in an effort to prevent cancer development. When we think about interception, particularly for those people who are at high risk, as you heard, um, about 10% of uh, pancreas cancers have some inherited predisposition. Here, uh, most of the time, these individuals have already seen that initial cancer causing genetic change. So here we're trying to vaccinate these people after they've seen that initial insult in order to intercept cancer development. And this is where we believe that vaccines may be critical in actually engaging what we call cancer killing T cells. So these cancer killing T cells are a very important component of our own immune system that we can actually harness to kill precancer cells and cancer cells. 
So what do these cancer killing T cells do? In particularly, what do trained cancer killing T cells do? Well, they recognize fragments of cancer specific proteins that are displayed on cancer cells or even precancer cells. And vaccines can actually be quite effective in training these cancer killing T cells to recognize cancer or precancer, and they can even induce new killer T cells to kill cancer. So what we've actually learned and what we're learning is that in the precancer phase, when that first genetic alteration uh, occurs in a normal cell to turn it into a precancer cell, there's actually an early influx of these cancer killing T cells. So they actually are engaged initially in what we call the elimination phase. But over time, unfortunately, these cancer killing T cells can uh, reach an equilibrium and actually get worn out or functionally exhausted. They're unable to do what they're supposed to do, which is recognize precancer or cancer cells and kill them. And over time, as that precancer becomes a cancer, these killer T cells can get excluded from entering the cancer entirely. So what we believe is that we believe that we can target that initial elimination phase, this precancer phase, and use a vaccine to actually re-educate these killer T cells to recognize and kill any precancerous or cancerous cells, and importantly, keep these uh, killer T cells reinvigorated. In pancreas cancer specifically, I'd like to point out that there is a huge window of opportunity to intercept the development of pancreas cancer. And just a couple of points here is that uh, the time it takes actually from that first normal cell, uh, that genetic change to occur to make it into a precancer cell and eventually that develops into pancreas cancer, this whole process actually takes at least a decade. Not only this, but we now know that mutations in it or gene alterations in a gene called KRAS, which I'll really be focusing on later in our clinical trials, actually drives over 90% of pancreas cancer. So this is a shared target that is even present in the precancer stage and is really critical uh, in the majority of cases to driving the growth from precancer to pancreas cancer. And what we've seen um, in our group, and this is data from Dr. Liz Thompson, and now what other uh, groups are seeing is that these pre-pancreatic cancers actually do show evidence of killer T cell infiltration. So what you're seeing here are low-grade precancers, or what we call PANNs. Um, and you can see here in the brown dots, and I'm sorry, this is a little blurry, but you can see that these there is evidence of killer T cell infiltration. But as you go from low-grade precancers to high-grade precancer, there are actually other signals that come into play that block the function of these killer T cells and actually suppress their function. So what we're trying to do now um, using advanced technologies, including spatial technologies where we can look at the cells in relation to each other, we're trying to understand what other killer T cell, T cell excluding signals need to be blocked in order to get the best in interception approach. So before I go any further to kind of talk to you a little bit about the clinical trials and what we are doing, I'd like to just stop here and emphasize and summarize why pancreas cancer is so ideal for intercepting before that cancer develops. Well, first, as I mentioned, is the timeline. This whole process we know now from the first genetic alteration takes at least a decade. The second point is we now know, as you have heard, that there are high-risk groups. At least 10% of pancreas cancers can be attributed directly to familial inheritance. Thirdly, thanks to the foundation and many groups, there's more emphasis on screening. So now more high-risk individuals are getting screened using imaging surveillance. Also, um, genetic testing is now used um, very routinely. But unfortunately, even the chance of cure for these high-risk patients is surgical resection, which as you know, is an extensive surgery. So we're really trying to come up with non-invasive ways to intercept this disease before cancer develops. 
Fourthly, as you all know, most patients present um, after the cancer has left the pancreas and metastasized. And this is one of the reasons why there, there are poor patient outcomes. And as I mentioned earlier, um, in the precancer phase, there are these activated killer T cells, but later on they get suppressed and excluded as the cancer develops. So really we need to intervene early in the precancer phase. And finally, and this is important for our study, which I'll talk about later, is that there is a shared target. Over 90% of precancers have genetic uh, changes in KRAS, which drives the growth of the cancer. So I've been talking mostly about primary interception, which again is identifying these people, otherwise healthy people who are at high risk of developing pancreas cancer and developing vaccine-based therapy to intercept the development of cancer. But I would like to point out that we are also working in a related space, and I've termed the secondary interception for those people who have undergone surgery, gotten intensive chemotherapy, but even with surgery and chemotherapy, in 60 to 80% of cases, the cancer actually comes back. So we really need to do better in this space as well. And so we and other groups are also testing vaccine-based therapy to prevent recurrence of this cancer after surgery and chemotherapy. So before I go into a couple of the clinical studies that I'm going to highlight, I just want to mention here, um, just tying it to the technological advances, um, that their current technologies have really been helping drive the development of vaccines. And I'm going to provide you a couple of examples here. Um, first is that not only can we uh, manufacture vaccines that we can um, use uh, for, for each patient, but we can actually personalize these vaccines. So these vaccines can actually be individualized to each patient's tumor. And the way this works is that when a patient comes in, their cancer is biopsied. The tissue is then sent for sequencing to understand the genetic makeup of the cancer. And then we can use computerized algorithms to to understand which mutations or genetic changes are most likely to evoke an immune response. And from this information, we're then able to generate a personalized vaccine. And I'm gonna give you an example for this in the next slide. The second area of advancement and interest has been this resurgence in the mRNA technology really spurred by the COVID pandemic, although mRNA vaccines have now been studied for decades in the context of cancer, the COVID vaccine has really brought this technology into light. And this, um, this technology, we believe, is more versatile. It's easier to more uh, quickly and uh, broadly manufacture mRNA vaccines. Um, and they may actually induce more potent immune responses. And then the third area that's really driving vaccine development is that we now have the technologies to analyze tissue samples and blood samples that come from these clinical trials, even on a single cell basis. And we can look at how these single cells are interacting with one another using spatial technologies. And the reason why this is important is that now we're better able to understand why some people are responding to our vaccine and immunotherapies and why others are not. And that's going to help us as well in the precancer space as we develop uh, better blood-based biomarkers. So I'd like to highlight this study next, which is a personalized mRNA vaccine study. And this was uh, this is uh, uh, run by Dr. Vinod Balachandran, and this data was published recently at the ASCO conference, and this is um, funded by the Lust Garden. Um, this is a study where uh, patients had undergone surgery and intensive chemotherapy, and they had an mRNA vaccine generated based on the patient's individual tumor. So each patient got a vaccine that was specific to their individual tumor. And what the investigators found was that those patients who were able to generate an immune response to the targets in the vaccine 
were less likely to recur from pancreatic cancer after surgery and after chemotherapy. This was a small pilot study, but it, it has generated a lot of interest and it's leading to now a larger study to really look at the efficacy in a larger study. Um, our uh, vaccine is, as I mentioned, targeting mutated KRAS. A mutated KRAS is one of the first genetic alterations that occurs in the precancer phase that drives the growth of precancer to cancer. So we've um, generated a slightly different vaccine in which we are vaccinating people with short fragments of proteins that correspond to certain KRAS mutations. And in this study, each patient gets the same vaccine. At the prior study, they were getting different individualized vaccine, but since our vaccine targets cover uh, the majority of KRAS mutations, we are able to do this as an off-the-shelf approach. And again, these patients in this study underwent surgery, they got their chemotherapy, had no evidence of disease left over on scan, but had a, have a very high risk of recurrence. And what we have found, and this is early data, um, is that these patients were able to, again, mount a response in their blood to the uh, vaccine targets. And what you're seeing here in the graphs, this is a bit complicated, but we are measuring the T cells that are reacting to the vaccine targets. And you can see here that there is an increase um, in both these patient examples. Um, and this is very preliminary interim analysis. The study is still um, ongoing, but we do have most of the patients enrolled here. But what we have seen is that those patients who were able to generate an immune response, as I just showed you, a strong immune response had a um, less chance of their disease recurring than those patients who were not able to generate a robust immune response. And again, this is... Um, preliminary data. So now I'd really like to get to the exciting part of this study. So as I mentioned, we um, tested this vaccine approach in patients who had undergone surgery and chemotherapy. Um, we found that the vaccine was safe and also it was able to generate an immune response. So now we have actually taken that vaccine into the first primary interception clinical trial for pancreas cancer. And again, this has been supported by the Lust Garden to try and intercept the development of pancreas cancer in this precancer phase. So just to review again, we're here. These are the mutations in KRAS. This is what we're targeting with our vaccine. This is a small pilot study, so we're enrolling 20 patients. We've enrolled five to date, and it's really to taste, test the safety of this vaccine and this population and also measure the immune response. This is the first step um, towards interception. These patients are getting three doses of the vaccine every two weeks and then two boosters every four weeks. And again, this is early data. We have some data from uh, the patients who have enrolled, and we have seen that um, these two patients have, again, um, generated an immune response um, in response to the vaccine after they have been vaccinated. So I'd like to just end here with a few key points and takeaways. Where are we now and what does the future hold? Vaccines are promising for the interception of pancreas cancer and also preventing recurrence, but further work needs to be done to optimize these vaccine strategies as I had described. Secondly, the mRNA technology has really reignited interest and may allow for broader scale manufacturing of these vaccines that may be quicker and the potential to evoke more potent responses. Multiple shared and unique vaccine targets are now being tested and are being moved into the pre-cancer space. Um, clinical trials and advanced technologies will also allow us to discover why some people are responding better and allow us to discover what we call biomarkers in the blood, which can help predict response to vaccine therapies in the precancerous setting. 
Um, although small, um, our initial interception clinical trial, and now there are a couple um, testing the same approach for other disease, uh, diseases, are paving the way for the next generation of vaccines for interception. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Zaidi. That was incredible, and it, and as you said, it's it's early days in this in this first interception trial. But I think it's it's hard to it's hard to overstate how important that first trial is. And even though this is small, this is really now opened up everyone's thinking about this. And the other thing that I found very exciting in your presentation, I'm so used to watching presentations about pancreas cancer where we list about why pancreas cancer is the hardest and why it's so challenging. To see that, that slide of saying why pancreas cancer is so ripe for vaccines for interception. And particularly thinking about KRAS and how that's often a, a challenge for treating advanced pancreas cancer because it's difficult to target KRAS. Everyone has it, or many patients have that same mutation, makes it difficult, but flipping it over and thinking of it as an immunologist, you say, well, here's a common feature that we can make an off the shelf vaccine for. So, really exciting to see that. And congratulations on all the work. And we'll have you back soon to hear more about progress of, of those trials and, and see how things are going. Thank you. I appreciate it. So for the, the next um, portion of, of the webinar today, we're gonna turn and think uh, a little bit about, you know, what's changed in terms of how we think about treating disease after it's diagnosed and for the majority of those patients that are diagnosed in, in later stages and how new technologies are coming in that are allowing us to use therapies that exist in smarter ways and in better ways and in safer and more effective ways for our, our patients. Um, <clears throat> So first joining us for this discussion is uh, Dr. Chung, um, who joins us. He's a radiation oncologist at the Miami Cancer Institute, um, where he is vice chair and medical director of proton therapy and photon therapy in the Department of Radiation Oncology. He is principal investigator for a number of trials and is going to talk to us a bit about um, what's new and what's exciting in radiation therapy for pancreatic cancer. And Dr. Chung, I believe you'll tell us some stories about how <clears throat> Radiation has been difficult to deploy in, in pancreas cancer for a number of reasons, but some new approaches that are allowing us to, to target it much more uh, specifically to the tumor are leading to better outcomes for, for patients. So Dr. Chung, welcome, and I look forward to, to learning about what's new and your work in the area. Uh, Dr. Rickman, thanks so much for the introduction, and uh, thanks to Lust Gardner for the invitation to, uh, to share uh, some of this exciting new technology uh, and, and some of the, the clinical trials data that's emerging. Uh, so the title of this uh, presentation, again, is Ablative MR-Guided Radiation Therapy uh, and Tumor Treating Fields for Pancreas Cancer. So these are two separate uh, and really cutting-edge technologies that um, each have, I think, their own place. Uh, we do have some ongoing clinical uh, trials that combine these, actually, that I'll talk on. Uh, but just to give you an introduction of both of these is really, the hopefully, the goal uh, and takeaway from this, uh, the next 20 minutes or so. So for those who are not familiar with radiation therapy, you know, this is a technology that has been used to treat many, many cancers, including pancreas cancer for many years. And fundamentally, radiation therapy uh, works by destroying DNA uh, of cancer cells. Um, and, and this is something that um, is, is uh, done non-invasively uh, and is, uh, is an important uh, tool in the toolbox for treating cancers, including pancreas cancer. Now, the principles of radiation therapy really from day one have been really twofold. So it might seem pretty simple and, and pretty obvious, but one is to deliver um, a high dose and a tumorocidal dose to cancer cells uh, and to deliver as little and ideally zero radiation to normal tissue, uh, thereby increasing the probability of tumor eradication uh, as well as minimizing the risk of side effects. And so over the years, the technology that we've been, um, uh, that we've had to treat patients with radiation have evolved substantially. So that, you know, I think the analogy would be if you look at your phone even five years ago, let alone 10 years ago, you, you know how different it is than compared to today. And so if you look over the last several decades, radiation therapy uh, technologies have evolved uh, going back to the, the late 1800s when x-rays were first described all the way through uh, to current day. And there have been tremendous advances in the ability to, to meet those two principles being to deliver high dose to tumor and minimize dose to everything else. And this is actually what radiation therapy used to look like many, many years ago. And you can obviously see that it, it looks pretty, uh, pretty basic and pretty rudimentary. And therefore, the, the ability to be aggressive and deliver potentially curative doses of radiation were, were very limited at that time. Uh, and, but we have evolved. Um, 
but still, even within the last several years, being able to deliver high dose to tumor and as little dose to everything else really was was limited. And and where the MRI guided radiation technology come into play is is advancing uh, that ability. But this is uh, a visual showing uh, what radiation therapy used to look like. Uh, if you can see in the middle of the, the scan here, that red circle uh, represents the target where the tumor is. And that's really where we want to get the, um, the high dose of radiation. The color wash that you see represents radiation dose. So the higher the dose, the redder or oranger the color, and the lower doses are represented by this cooler blue color. And so what you can see are, are um, a couple important things. So one is there's color that extends outside of the red circle where the tumor is. Uh, and in the image on the left, there's clearly a lot of high dose going through uh, a lot of the bowel, the kidney, the spine. Uh, we do a little bit better on the right where there's less red um, outside of the tumor, but there's still a considerable amount being delivered to tissues. Uh, and so as we are, uh, and, and this was, you know, this is, was the, the sort of the state of the art uh, several decades ago, but of course, being able to not necessarily deliver high dose only to tumor limited how much radiation dose could be safely prescribed. Uh, you can see here that the uh, conformality or the ability to limit radiation dose, you can see the sort of the circles and the colors are a bit more um, tightly um, brought in to where the tumor is. So there's less radiation dose being delivered to the stomach nearby and the intestines. Um, uh, and so, again, technology has, especially for patients who have locally advanced unresectable disease, historically, the outcomes have been Okay, but not great. And what I mean by that is a number of trials have compared chemotherapy alone for unresectable locally advanced disease and chemotherapy plus radiation therapy. And I would highlight that the radiation therapy done or used in, in nearly all trials to date have been in the sort of modest range, what we call non-ablative. Uh, and in this landmark trial called the LAP-07 trial, uh, the addition of, of non-ablative radiation therapy actually didn't improve, uh, improve or impact survival really at all in the two-year two survival rate was around 20%. You know, I would note that in this trial, the, the local control was substantially better with radiation, but that did not translate into an improvement in survival. So we do know that radiation can impact uh, cancer cells, can keep things from growing locally, uh, but in terms of overall survival, this trial uh, in the era before multi-agent uh, chemotherapy really became the standard of care, at least did not show survival benefits. So the question really becomes, can we uh, intensify radiation to improve local outcomes. And why that is important is that we know that up to about a third of deaths of pancreas cancer are due to local or regional progression of the tumor. And that's even in patients who have uh, maybe some limited metastatic disease. This was a, a this is now a well-known um, um, uh, rapid autopsy study of patients who had pancreas cancer done at Hopkins uh, a number of years ago. And, and uh, those data come from, um, and, and this, this, this study showed uh, that local progression is significant in a lot of patients. So in select patients, I, one of the, the ongoing uh, main hypotheses at this time is that survival might be impacted if we're able to better improve local control. And as I mentioned before, the radiation doses that we could historically give were not maybe good enough to, to achieve long-term local control. Uh, and could we improve that uh, with advanced technologies, which is where the MRI guidance comes into play. There are uh, increasing studies um, showing that higher doses does, in fact, improve local tumor control. Uh, and you can see here with, with increasing dose, there seems to be an improvement in at least one year local control uh, in this recently published study in the Red Journal. Now, the challenge to delivering high doses, as I sort of alluded to before with radiation, is that th these tumors uh, in the pancreas normally um, are very, very close to organs that uh, just are not tolerant of high doses of radiation. So that especially includes the stomach, the, uh, the duodenum, the small intestine, the large intestine, you know, these are organs that if we deliver high doses, potentially could have severe consequences in terms of toxicity. And, and those toxicities include things like uh, ulcerations, uh, bleeding, perforation of the bowel. Uh, and these are potentially fatal events uh, that we, of course, uh, need to avoid. Uh, so delivering as high of a dose as possible uh, really has been uh, limited by the fact of this just challenging anatomic um, uh, situation. So challenges to delivering ablative dose on top of that, or very, very high dose, have been that, you know, the state of the art in radiation therapy and the current standard of care is using um, CT scans to image the patient before treatment, and then the patient is positioned, uh, and the, the position is tweaked even uh, as small as on a, on a millimeter basis. But the image quality for CT scans done on radiation delivery machines really is suboptimal, and I'll show you some examples of that. 
with the current standard of care, when patients get radiation therapy, uh, there is not an, there is not C, there are not CT scans or other scans that are able to be done during treatment. So there uh, is some uncertainty, especially for tumors that may move, like pancreas cancers, as the patient uh, breathes uh, during treatment. Uh, of course, the, um, there is respiratory motion, as I mentioned before. So some of uh, some pancreas can, tumors can move upwards of two or even three centimeters. So if we're trying to deliver high dose with a pinpoint uh, accuracy, that can that can pose a challenge as well. And as radiation therapy is typically given over multiple days, and in sometimes in some cases multiple weeks, the internal anatomy, especially the bowel and the stomach anatomy, is always variable just because of normal physiology. And the ability to account for those changes each day with standard radiation machines really is very lacking. So essentially, the same radiation dose will be delivered to the same place despite changes in anatomy uh, on standard radiation machines that use CT scans for image guidance. So let me show you what some of these uh, limitations look like. So one is, uh, you can see that um, on the left, the, the CT scan on the left looks very different than the one on the right. And the difference here is that when patients have radiation treatment, they have to have a simulation scan for mapping. That scan looks very different. And you can see it looks much more fuzzy on the right-hand side. And this, this is the scan that's used for image guidance. And on the right-hand side, you can see that, um, or maybe you can you can't see exactly where the pancreas tumor is versus the intestine versus the stomach. Uh, and, and therefore, there was a lot of uncertainty in terms of uh, the tumor positioning on a day-to-day -day basis with CT scans. This is what it sort of looks like when we treat patients with regular uh, radiation machines. Uh, we basically cannot image inside the patient. All we do is uh, we can see the patient lying on the table, but there's not an internal uh, imaging capability. So we at Miami Cancer Institute became the second uh, uh, institution in the country treating patients with what's called the Meridian LINAC. So this is a device that, use, that uses MRI scans instead of CT scans for image guidance, and I'll show you the advantages there. But if we go back to our principles of radiation therapy again, uh, essentially MRI-guided radiation uh, allows us to excel in both of these areas. So deliver a higher dose to tumor cells and deliver a uh, much lower dose to normal tissue, and I'll show you why. So the image on the left is a CT scan. Again, it's a little bit fuzzy. The image on the right is an image from our, um, our Meridian device. And you can see clearly there's a night and day difference here where the tumor versus the intestine can be clearly outlined on the right versus on the left. The other advantage here is that treatment, as I mentioned before, with CT scans is not delivered with scans that are done during the treatment itself. With this MRI-guided technology, not only can we see, treat, uh, see inside the body, but this is a continuous MRI scan that's being acquired during treatment. So we know exactly where the tumor is. You can see that the outlined area, and I think it's yellow or green, uh, is, is following along in real time where the tumor is. So as the patient breathes or moves, we can know where that is, and we can see what's happening. And not only that, we can actually trigger the treatment to, be, to stop if the tumor moves out of the correct position, which is highlighted in blue. So when the tumor moves out of that area, the machine automatically turns off for safety purposes. You know, we don't want to undercover tumor or over-treat the intestine, uh, and we can, we can automatically do that. So this is a, a process that happens throughout treatment. So this obviously improves the accuracy of treatment and the confidence that we have to deliver very high doses. Uh, and last but not least, you know, the radiation um, doses that I, that I um, that as we talked about before, um, you know, on a standard machine would be delivered sort of as a carbon copy in terms of the distribution. But we know the anatomy will change. The tumors may move each day. Um, the stomach may be fuller one day than the next. And we can adapt treatment with this technology uh, so that the uh, radiation dose matches where the tumor now has gone and is carved out of the, the, the intestine nearby, uh, allowing us to, again, safely dose escalate and minimize dose to uh, these organs. And this is, again, the color represents dose. You can see each day it's a personalized radiation treatment as opposed to a carbon copy of um, uh, uh, with a standard machine. So what is the patient experience here? These are, these are treatments typically given in five once a day outpatient uh, sessions. It's completely non-invasive. There is no anesthesia. There are no implanted fiducial markers as is needed with standard radiation machines and essentially little to no downtime. Most patients will work the same day, play golf. We have a lot of patients come from out of town and we'll get on a plane the same or next day. The, the advantages to delivering much higher doses of radiation and I should put that into context. We're delivering the equivalent of two or, or not, if not up to three times the, the highest dose that we would otherwise give with CT, uh, CT guided radiation. Um, some of the initial outcomes uh, were presented from our, from our institution here at a European meeting last year. Uh, in 50 patients, uh, it presented outcomes uh, in, in patients uh, who treated at our institution, typically who had uh, upfront chemotherapy, 
uh, and then this ablative high dose five uh, five treatment radiation therapy. And you can see, I mentioned before, the two-year survival rate historically was around 20% um, for inoperable pancreas cancers. Uh, and believe it or not, the uh, the outcome in our uh, experience uh, actually was right around 50%, which is a dramatic, uh, obviously, difference in long-term survival at two years. It's retrospective, uh, but still exciting nonetheless. We did combine our data with other institutions looking at the same um, at the same patient population. Uh, this was almost 150 patients presented at the main radiation, uh, international radiation oncology meeting last year, which is called ASTRO. Uh, again, five treatments delivered on this Meridian LINAC device uh, after typically chemotherapy. Uh, and we saw a similar outcomes. So in terms of local control, at two years, the 83% outcome was substantially better than what we would expect with lower doses of radiation. Uh, and potentially that translated into, again, that that uh, better than historical number of 20%. Here we saw overall survival of two years of right around, again, 50%. Um, uh, so, you know, this, this phenomenon is being seen not just at our institution. The safety of this approach, however, when I first started using this, these types of doses, I was very, very nervous. And over the last five years or so, I've become uh, much more um, uh, at ease just seeing how well patients tolerate this. There was a phase two trial looking at the safety of this prospectively uh, called the SMART trial. And the outcomes of this were presented as an oral presentation at our uh, at this year's ASTRO meeting. Um, I'm not going to go through all of the details, but it's, it was a pretty large trial, 136 patients, with the primary endpoint being uh, grade three or higher being meaning severe toxicity uh, that was uh, definitely related to SMART, which is this type of radiation delivered on this uh, MRI-guided device uh, within a 90-day period. And believe it or not, and I'm one of the national PIs of this trial, uh, we, I think we all were shocked to see that, that number of 0%, uh, indicating that this treatment um, is very well tolerated. And that, that matches what we see in the clinic, even to the point where this is a great example of uh, of an outcome or what, what patients typically experience. This was a, a patient who received uh, this high dose radiation uh, and her daughter sent me an email saying, well, she, you know, she had so much pain before the radiation. Now her pain is so much better. I think a week later, she, she went to Hawaii and they hiked Diamond Head Crater and, and did all of these other fun things. So, you know, the point being that quality of life is typically at least maintained, if not improved substantially because of the radiation therapy, especially patients who have pain. So very excited to, um, to, to share that we are uh, moving forward with a phase three randomized trial based on the early favorable outcomes of, of this approach called the Lapablate trial. So it's a trial that will open next year for locally advanced pancreas cancer patients who receive either fulfirinox or modified fulfirinox or gemcitabine and paclitaxel without progression, and then are randomized in a one to two fashion to either no ablative radiation therapy or uh, this five fraction radiation, uh, ablative radiation regimen, looking at tear survival as the primary endpoint. You can see the PI team uh, here. There are many um, uh, very well-known uh, individuals in the pancreas cancer world uh, that I don't need to mention, um, but uh, that I'm sure you recognize here. So very uh, proud and, and, and um, excited to be part of this team. So to wrap up uh, the, the sort of the discussion about ablative radiation, and I know we're a little bit short on time here, um, is you know why, why would survival be any different based on the high dose versus low dose uh, that we're delivering to these tumors? And could it be because we are prolonging survival uh, because of improved local control in patients who receive higher radiation dose? So we looked at, at causes of uh, mortality in patients treated at our institution with high, with high ablative radiation therapy. And long story short, as you can see, table two lists specific causes of death uh, in our patients. Um, and there's a, there's a variety of, of reasons related to cancer versus not. There was you know, one patient who fell and hit their head, unfortunately, and, and passed away from that and not related to their tumor. But if you look at table three on the bottom, the local regional cancer progression at the bottom row was about 7%. And that is substantially lower than historical um, expectations. And so I think that that leads or that, that sort of that fuels the hypothesis that in fact, maybe we are impacting survival because of decreasing deaths due to local, local regional cancer progression. You know, ultimately we, we, we um, you know, we hope to find out the answer to this in the Lapable trial, you know, but still the, the unmet need is that in patients who do not progress after induction chemotherapy um, and who will likely have long-term excellent local control after ablative radiation, the vast majority of patients progress uh, distantly. And that is typically in the liver and peritoneum. And so these patients inevitably had micrometastatic disease there, probably from the start, that ended up, uh, you know, just growing after a certain period of time. Uh, and so there is, you know, salvage chemotherapy at this point is, is typically not very effective. And so what other novel strategies can we think about? And that's where the tumor treating fields um, um, technology 
I think might come into play. So this is a device um, that uh, that uh, essentially um, uh, delivers alternating electrical currents uh, that has been demonstrated to have efficacy for a number of pancreas cancer cells or a number of cancer types, including pancreas cancer. And what you can see here is that essentially there are pads placed on the skin of the patient that are worn for most of the day uh, and can be here delivered to the majority, if not the entirety of the abdomen. Uh, and these uh, tumor treating fields disrupt cell division. Uh, and you can see here that through multiple phases of cell division, there can be uh, effects of these of this tumor treating field. And why this is so exciting for pancreas cancer patients, and um, uh, it, there's not a slide on this, is that uh, this is a treatment that uh, has been the most effective treatment to treat a type of uh, brain cancer called glial glioblastoma and substantially improved survival over standard chemotherapy and radiation, uh, now making uh, tumor treating fields a standard of care and included in NCC and re NCCN uh, recommendations uh, for that deadly disease. So the question is, is that is that benefit translatable to pancreas cancer uh, patients? There are early clinical outcomes uh, from the phase two, what's called PANOVA trial, uh, that looked at uh, the addition of tumor treating fields to chemotherapy, being gemcitabine or gemcitabine and uh, napaclitaxel. And you can see here when compared to historical outcomes of chemotherapy alone, uh, the data with the addition of tumor treating fields in this PANOVA trial were substantially um, better. And you know it's a small trial, but at least uh, hypothesis generating. And that led to the ongoing phase three PANOVA-3 trial uh, in locally advanced pancreas cancer patients who get randomized to either gemcitabine and napaclitaxel or with the addition of tumor treating fields, the primary endpoint being overall survival. This trial does not include radiation therapy and a number of patients who have locally advanced pancreas cancer may in fact be recommended to have radiation. And that is where uh, this uh, clinical trial um, uh, comes into play. So this is a, a phase two trial that, um, that is opening here soon at, at MCI. Uh, and I'm the PI of the trial that, that is looking at whether or not the addition of uh, recurrence rates in the abdomen might be improved with the addition of tumor protruding fields. And as I mentioned before, the majority of patients do have recurrences in the liver and peritoneum, peritoneum after making it through a lot of chemotherapy and then radiation. Uh, so this is a trial that looks at whether or not tumor treating fields that would start at the time of the radiation therapy and be continued out back uh, as maintenance therapy until um, there was evidence of disease progression in the abdomen, uh, whether or not this would impact the natural progression uh, in recurrence patterns of, uh, of pancreas cancer uh, patients. And theoretically, uh, if this could at least delay, if not prevent uh, progression in the liver that might otherwise lead to liver failure or other morbidity uh, and mortal mortality causes, potentially this could improve at least progression for free, free survival. And while overall survival is not um, the primary endpoint of this trial, I think looking into the future, you know, could there potentially be an impact on OS? Uh, I would say, hypothetically, uh, we would have to wait and see, but I think that that is the potential for this sort of trimodality therapy of chemotherapy, radiation, and potentially tumor treating fields. So with that in conclusion, um, you know, the data that we've seen so far have been very, very exciting for MR guided radiation uh, in that uh, the safety appears to be there despite the very, very high doses that we're giving. Um, it, there are um, potentially impacts on long-term survival that we'll have to, to see if they bear out in the prospective randomized trials. Um, I would highlight that quality of life, again, is maintained or improved for most patients, uh, that this is not detrimental there, um, minimal or no side effects for most. Um, and then lastly, you know, certainly this technology and the tumor treating fields technology offers tremendous hope to patients. So thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Chung. That, that fascinating work and so exciting to see how you're able to harness all of this technology to really very personalize the way that the radiation is, is delivered to each patient and, and have the kind of outcomes and with the safety that, that we really need for a patient. So thank you again for, for sharing and uh, uh, really congratulations on the work and we'll look forward to see what comes out of the, uh, the prospective trials and, and, and the impact this will really have and as this continues to develop. Thanks so much. So, all right. So for our last uh, talk for today, so we, we've, with this webinar, traveled throughout the stages of pancreas cancer. We've traveled throughout the country from Boston to San Diego to, uh, to Baltimore to Florida. Now we're back to Long Island, where we're going to hear um, from a dynamic duo of Dr. Dan King and Dr. Amber Habowski to talk about um, personalized approaches now to select drugs to treat uh, pancreatic cancer. Uh, so Dr. Dan King is a a GI medical oncologist uh, based out of RJ Zuckerberg Cancer Center, and he's the Director of Research and Development for Northwell Health Cancer Institute, Center for uh, Genomic Medicine here on Long Island. Um, Dr. King's uh, uh, clinical research includes looking at uh, circulating markers of DNA, as well as being the site PI at Northwell 
for the PASO-1 study, which I'm sure you'll hear more about from him uh, and Amber, Dr. Hobowski today. And Dr. Hobowski is a researcher at the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory working in the Luskarten dedicated lab there led by our chief scientist, Dr. David Tuberson. Um, her research really focuses on developing uh, patient-derived models of pancreas cancer where we can look at responses and drug effects. And, and as part of that runs the, uh, the, the clinical grade uh, pancreatic organoid lab at Cold Spring Harbor and where she does work as part of the PASO-1 study, analyzing all of the, the patient-derived organoids that are generated through that study uh, at, at Cold Spring Harbor. So Dr. King, Dr. Hrabowski, thank you so much uh, for joining us here today and um, look forward to, to hearing your presentation. I've, I've heard you talk together. You are a well-oiled team, I think, both in presenting, but also as we'll hear in the, the research that you're doing. It really shows the power of bringing together the lab and the clinic here. And when we truly understand the, the patient and the, the disease itself, what that opens up in terms of opportunities for, for novel treatments. So take it away. Sure. So much for the invitation. And it really is, you know, a duo and a collaboration working with Amber here at Cold Spring Harbor and getting uh, patients over from Northwell Health. Uh, we are, you know, we work together so closely uh, because our work is complementary and, and, and fun doing science together. So thank you for the invitation for us to be able to present uh, together. I think we'll start with Amber, if you wouldn't mind uh, starting us off with a little bit of uh, a tutorial on what an organoid is. Yeah, thank you, Dan, and thank you, Dr. Aikman and Lust Garden for the invitation. Um, so the first thing is, what is an organoid? Um, so I obviously spend a lot of time talking about organoids and researching them, and really what this is is a very powerful model system that we can grow from a patient's tumor to be able to study that tumor in the lab. Um, so organoids have a few decades long history, but we've been able to really determine the right methodology and protocols to be able to grow both human and mouse pancreatic cancer organoids. And the Tuvison lab has really been on the forefront of this technology. Um, and you can see kind of an image of organoids in the bottom right of what these look like. They're a little sphere round ball of cells. And we can continue to grow these cells and propagate. And that really allows us to study an individual patient's tumor in the lab. And as you can imagine, once we had these little avatars we could grow in the lab, the exciting part about this is the promise for personalized medicine. So the idea behind this is a patient would undergo a resection, a biopsy, and we would get some small piece of their tissue. From that tissue, we could then create a patient-derived organoid or PDO that is specific for just that patient. We can then profile these organoids. One of the important things we do is drug screening. So we can expose these organoids to different drugs and see how quickly it kills them and see what they're maybe sensitive or resistant to. In the graph on the right, we're looking at a response to gemcitabine, a standard of care chemotherapy. And each of those black lines is a different PDO or a different organoid from a different patient. And you can see some of those lines are very left shifted. That means they're more sensitive. They respond quicker to the drug and their viability drops off quickly and they die. For other PDOs, they're more resistant. And so this would potentially suggest the patient might also be resistant. One of the ways we then diagram this information is by looking at the area under the curve. So the violin button on the right is showing the same data. Each dot is a different organoid line. And you'll see some are in that blue area on the bottom that suggests they're more sensitive. Others are in the red area at the top. They're more right shifted, more resistant. And this kind of data display will be important later when we really talk about how different organoids are responding to therapy. But really the big idea and what we've been interested in is trying to determine what are the best therapies for each patient and how can we use PDOs to investigate that? Yeah, great. So you know, before diving into the organoids specifically and how we use that in the context of this trial, we're going to back up just slightly and talk about pancreas cancer. In general, most patients with pancreas cancer are unfortunately presenting in the metastatic space, which is, you know, all the more reason why we need Dr. Zaidi's research and others who've spoken in this call and Blue Star to be able to find this cancer earlier. For patients who have metastatic disease, we have two good options. Two pivotal phase three clinical trials showed the benefit of the Fulfirinox regimen and the gemcitabine and paclitaxel regimen when compared to gemcitabine alone. But we have yet to have a large randomized trial comparing those two regimens against each other to try to figure out which one is better. And not only that, but we don't know in any given individual patient 
who's more likely to respond to one over the other. And as we've learned from other cancer types, there likely are some biomarkers that if we knew, if we knew ahead of time, we could use that information to help guide therapy, to help guide decision-making. And so this trial is doing a lot of things in one. It is a large multinational trial. And what we're gonna do, you could go to the next slide, is in this, this trial is a phase two multi-institutional randomized trial, which at the outset is looking at the advantage of fulferinox versus gemcivir, nab, paclitaxel. And while that's the primary endpoint, that is, that is not the only thing that we're doing here. We are doing a very broad molecular characterization of patients' tumors that go through this trial. A lot of that work is being done by Amber at Colesping Harbor Laboratory uh, uh, in order for us to understand if organoids and the pharmacotyping results from organoids can uh, ultimately help us determine who's likely to respond to one or uh, a drug over another, um, as well as you can see on the left, multiple other molecular characterizations, whole genome sequencing, RNA sequencing, so we can get a sense of whether the organoids match the patient's a molecular profile and whether the molecular profile, how that compares, how it really correlates with the response that we see in patients to try to understand from a deep scientific basis what biomarkers may help us understand who is gonna be responding to one therapy over another therapy. The main thing that we're gonna be talking about uh, in the next few slides is the organoid component and whether the testing, so-called pharmacotyping of organoids in a dish may help us understand that a little bit more. Now, in order to do this PDO pharmacotyping or drug screening, we've made several different advances to be able to do this in the lab in a high throughput manner. So on the right, I'm showing you some drug screening plates. The clear plate is a 96 well plate. You can see pretty large wells. The middle plates are 384 and the plate on the right is a 1536 well plate. That means there's 1,500 wells in that plate. And we're able to use these plates to put a small amount of organoids in each of those wells and then a bunch of different drugs and concentrations of drugs. And that allows us to pack in a lot of information and data that we're able to get from these plates. In order to use these plates, we've also had to adapt to using automated liquid handling devices. And I'm showing you some images of those devices. And this is crucial because we can't physically pipette into these wells. And we would also introduce too much human error. So we've really gone to this high throughput automated system. And with this, we've also been working to custom build analysis software to really advance our pipeline. And so we're really excited for the advantages um, and progress we've made on this. And this has really been supported by the Lust Garden Foundation and really wouldn't be possible without their work. Now, looking specifically at the PASO-1 trial and where we're at with this, all of the patients that are consented have biopsies that are sent to Cold Spring Harbor for organoid generation. I'm showing you on the left um, where our samples are really coming from. Princess Margaret UHN is really the starters of this trial, so we've gotten a lot of samples from them. But you'll see that Northwell is really our next biggest contributor, and this has really started to initiate and take off once Dr. King took over. So far, we've gotten 98 samples, and we've had a pretty good success rate. We're able to generate organoids about two-thirds of the time. Now in this pie chart, you'll see there's 43 um, that have been done. And that means those are 43 organoid lines that have been developed and drug screened. And we're now able to start looking at how do those organoids correlate with patient outcomes. Now to give you a little bit of a flavor, Dan and I wanna walk you through two different patients. Um, this first patient is actually where PDO predicted a strong responder to standard of care. I'm showing you those violin plots that I mentioned. And you'll see there's many, many different organoids that are from our biobank shown in black. There's a little orange organoid with the blue arrow I have that's this specific patient. Now the top three drugs are really the regimen for, for, for fulfirinox. And you'll see they have an average resistant and then maybe a little bit of a sensitive response for renatecan. However, if you look at gemcybin nab paclitax on the bottom, you'll see that they're sensitive to both of those. So we would have predicted a good response. This patient was actually randomized to gem nab paclitaxel, and they were initially diagnosed in June 2021 with metastatic disease. However, following their initial treatment at their eight-week scan, they had a 64% decrease in their primary, although they did have some new hepatic meds. But excitingly, this patient continued to respond, and we were actually really quite thrilled when in September, a full year after their diagnosis, they showed a complete response. 
Um, so those of you who work in the pancreatic cancer field, you know how rare this is and how quite excited we've been on this. But it's also very exciting to see the organoid data was quite consistent and has predicted this strong response in this patient. I'll hand it over to Dan to discuss one of his more recent patients. Yeah, sure. You know, one of the ways that I talk about this trial with patients is I say, we're going to be doing detailed molecular analysis of your tumors, and we're going to be testing it in a dish. And we're going to try to understand if what's happening in a dish helps us help you. And this is, you know, one of the first cases I can think of where we have data that were generated by Amber that are so striking and so promising that it suggests that if this approach, if this approach works, this is really the future of medicine. I'm very, very excited about this trial in general, and I, I hope this becomes an anecdote that we can refer to. It's early days, but what we have here is a patient who who progressed on first line of therapy, and then we sought answers from the molecular data as to what we should do next, because the standard would be to switch to the other standard of therapy, fulfirinox regimen. So that's 5-FU, oxaliplatin, and reintecan. We have data, though, from the organoids suggesting that all the drugs that we think we should switch to are going to be resistant. And so it really makes us take a step back as an oncologist. Do I want to give my patient a treatment data, information, evidence that predicts that these therapies may not work well in that patient? It makes you wonder, you know, what other alternatives may there be? And so in the drug screening data that Amber's doing, we're also looking at you know, 100 other compounds. And here we looked at, I'm showing, we're showing two examples, erlotinib and nifatinib, tyrosine kinase inhibitors. And lo and behold, in the organoid data, we have drugs that are predicted to be very sensitive, predicted to work quite well in pancreas cancer. It turns out that actually a few years ago, there was a trial studying erlotinib, erlotinib with gemcitabine technically in pancreatic cancer, and it didn't work that well in unselected populations. In fact, its benefit was only in a matter of weeks in survival. So us oncologists are not very enthusiastic about the use of erlotinib in general. But here we have very specific information, information that's tailored perhaps to a patient's, an individual patient's response. And so in the light of having all resistant, of chemotherapy thought to be resistant, and now these drugs thought to be sensitive, it made us wonder if this is a great opportunity to use the Cold Spring Harbor organoid data to help guide decision-making. And in fact, we did. So about a month ago, I started uh, this patient on erlotinib, capecitamine and erlotinib, uh, and we'll see how she does. So far, she's tolerating the medicine fairly well. Uh, she had a little rash for which we started a cream that got, that went away. She's clinically doing fine. She's, uh, her, her pain levels have not worsened, and I've got a tumor marker response that seems to be improving. So it's, I've only started this a few weeks ago, and like I said, I hope this, uh, this comes to pass, and we could talk about it again in a couple of months. Uh, with the con with some response data, but so far it looks like she's responding fairly well to a drug that ordinarily I would not use in a patient with pancreas cancer. So it just highlights, you know, future potential perhaps of where this trial may go. The next thing we're going to be talking about is, so what we were just talking about is the PATH trial and the use of organoid data to help guide decision making in metastatic pancreas cancer, but. That is certainly not the only setting for which people are presenting with, pa with pancreatic cancer. We also have patients who have operable local uh, disease. And as is becoming the standard treatment, we typically give chemotherapy before consideration of surgery for patients with localized disease. Neoadjuvant therapy is the term of giving chemotherapy before consideration of surgery. So it made us wonder if organoids might also help us determine who should be getting what in the neoadjuvant setting. And while we can, while we, we do not yet have the technology to develop this technology, fa uh, to develop organoid results fast enough, we, we did study this in a retrospective fashion. So first we're gonna have Amber talk about our early work trying to develop a fast assay, and then I'll talk about some of the results that we have. 
Yep. So in our, our PASA-1 trial, currently our time from biopsy to drug screen data is about 60 days. And in the context of PASS, this is working quite well. But if we want to switch this neoadjuvant setting, we really need data quicker so that it can be in a clinically actionable timeline. So one of the things we did pilot was a rapid drug screen. So for this, we just looked at the five standard care chemotherapies and essentially tried to grow the cells as fast as possible and put them into a drug screen as quickly as possible. And we found that the fastest we could get a data return was in about seven days. Um, and you can see some of the, the variations in some of the different samples we looked at. However, one of the challenges is we could really only do this from resection since we did not get enough material from F and B for this type of experiment. Um, we did do several repeat experiments and repeat screens just to see how reproducible the data was. But really one of the things we want to work on in the future is how can we make this more of more rapid tests and make sure it's reliable and accurate so that we can use it in the neoadjuvant setting. Great. So the early work that we've done thus far in the neoadjuvant setting, I say early work because it takes a lot of time and a lot of samples to generate these data, but we've done it so far in a small cohort of our patients from our Northwell Health database. So in patients who were treated with neoadjuvant fulfirinox and then followed by resection, we had some data to try to understand if the, if the pharmacotyping uh, results from the organoids matched what happened uh, in the patient's experience. So in the table on the right, what you can see is that we had four patients that we were looking at their PDO sensitivity uh, uh, scores. So lower is better with more response. And what we can see is the patients at the, the bottom uh, who are thought to be the most sensitive uh, using the, the pharmacotyping assay using the, the five drugs seem to have the greatest amount of uh, tumor uh, size shrinkage by scan, um, by the most amount of cell death uh, when the tissue uh, was analyzed histologically after being exposed to neoadjuvant therapy and resected. And uh, these are the patients that had the longest time to recurrence. So at least in sort of this extreme example, looking at the patients that were the most sensitive, we can see that there appears that the data correlate pretty well. This is proof of concept, and certainly something that we need to be studying more broadly, and in part what we hope to achieve from the PASS-01 results by looking at larger numbers of patients and aggregating uh, the data with the correlation between real response and pharmacotyping response, we can make a better assessment of how strong these data correlate. And the last slide. So this is what we hope to achieve. And if we have this assay that's working fast enough and the results work pretty well, then the next step is testing this in a clinical trial. So we hope uh, to basically integrate organoid pharmacotyping into treatment decision-making for patients, not only in the metastatic setting, but also those patients where we need chemotherapy and we need chemotherapy to work to get the tissue off of the vessels to enable uh, pancreatic resections uh, to be worthwhile for those patients. So that's the other thing that we're going to be working on, uh, on now. Yeah. All right. And with that, we want to say a huge thank you to all of the folks that have worked on this, uh, on this research, the huge PASO One team, and really the enormous collaboration between Cold Spring Harbor and Northwell. Um, Dan and I are just a small part of that. It's, it's really a very large team that we're really building a bond to really advance our translational work, which is quite exciting. Um, and of course, huge thank you to the Lust Garden Foundation because none of our work would really be possible without them. This is quite high risk, uh, high risk, high reward work that that without Lust Garden's funding would be would be quite a challenge. So, and thank you for your for your time and attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Abaski, Dr. King. That was fantastic. It's great to see that that work and and the the long investment that's happened in terms of developing these approaches, developing these model systems, and it really coming out to paying off. And, and Dan, I hope your patient continues to, to respond and to do well, and, and that we'll have more of these stories of showing how you know, we can really use these technologies to have a real impact on, on real people and real patients out there. So thank you. And, and you know, overall, we've, we've heard a lot today, and we, we've, I'm sure everyone's brain is swimming as much as mine is trying to take this all in. But I will say, if there's one common theme that, that really cuts across, it's you know, by starting from the patient, by understanding where needs are and you know, being humble enough to allow ourselves to learn from their biology, 
and use the tools that are available rather than our own assumptions, we can really make progress. And I think we heard that from the work that Dr. Wolpin talked about in terms of integrating medical records, um, the work that we heard about targeting uh, 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 the people with recent onset type one di recent onset diabetes that that are at high risk. The great work that you're doing in personalized therapies, personalizing approaches, and allowing the machines to take over in terms of guiding radiation, um, and really taking a step back and letting the immune system teach us about what targets to go after. I think it's that theme of really letting the patients guide us to where we need to be and letting the biology teach us what, what we need to do as scientists and as clinicians. And, and I think that that really comes through in, in your presentation and all the presentations today. So thank, thank you, you so much. And Linda, I'll, I'll turn it back to you to uh, close us out for, for this afternoon. Great. Thanks, Andy. And of course, our thanks to Dr. Habowski and Dr. King for a great talk and for really providing our community with a, an a, an update on this state-of-the-art work that they're doing. And you can see their passion and how driven they are to deliver better outcomes for patients. We hope you've enjoyed tonight's presentation and have a better understanding of your donation dollars in action. And speaking of action, right now for our end of the year campaign, generous donors are matching every donation to Ralph Foundation. That's right. If we hit our goal, we're going to unlock $25,000 in a matching for a cure donation in honor of Michael Goldberg. So visit rawfoundation.org for more details. And be sure to mark your calendars for our next Wellness Wednesday, taking place on January 18th, where we'll welcome back Lily Horowitz of The Core Method, talking about creating healthy habits, not resolutions, for the new year. On behalf of everyone at Ralph Pancreatic Cancer Foundation, we deeply thank you for your support, and we send love and light to you as you continue your way through this holiday season and into the new year. Until next time, stay healthy, stay safe, and take good care. Good night.